Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and I am the coordinator for the Great Basin Science Delivery Project. Welcome to our webinar, Do Wyoming Big Sagebrush Communities Respond Similarly to Fuel Reduction Treatments Across the Northern Great Basin? Patterns of native and exotic understory growth during the first three years following prescribed fire, mechanical, tebuthyron, and imazepic treatments. Presented by Dr. Jean Shoup from Utah State University. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may ask questions at any time during this webinar by typing them into the questions pane <coughs> of your control panel at the top right of your screen. My responses will say they are from the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, but they're really from me. I will field questions for Dr. Shoup after the presentation. If you prefer to voice your questions to Dr. Shoup, please type me a request to unmute your microphone or telephone, and I will do so after the presentation. And I know that there are a couple of groups listening as well, and if you have people in your group that will want to voice their question directly, um, it would be a great experiment for us to unmute your microphones and, um, and see if that works. So if anyone's brave enough, feel free and give it a try. Um, now I would like to introduce our, our presenter. Jean Shoup is a plant ecologist at Utah State University. Dr. Shoup's primary research focus is the critical seed and seedling stages of plant establishment, or more precisely, the ecology of seed production and dispersal, seed survival and germination, and seedling survival and growth. The goal is to contribute to the development of an understanding of plant population and, ultimately, community dynamics by understanding processes controlling quantitative and spatial patterns of plant recruitment. Welcome, Jean, and thanks for being here today. Thank you. Let me get this started. Yeah, I'd just like to clarify a few things at the beginning. And uh, if you looked at the original advertisement, it kind of suggested that I would be talking about my recent work. But in reality, I'm presenting work that a lot of people are responsible for. So this is some of the work that's been coming out over our Sage Step network. In particular, it's the cheatgrass sagebrush portion of that. And quick overview, I suspect most people that are listening have some idea about uh, this project. But just to make sure everybody's up to speed, a quick overview. In this sage step project, we have 20 sites within the overall network. Seven of those are within the sagebrush cheatgrass portion of the network, and that's what we we will be focusing on today, and another 13 sites within the Juniper Encroachment Network. Now this is a multi-institution, multidisciplinary experimental study of, the, of, of uh, fuels treatment effects within the endangered sagebrush ecosystem. And we are addressing issues about vegetation, about the fuels, birds, insects, soils, hydrology, economics, and the social inspect, uh, aspects, and trying to integrate it all. <clears throat> In this particular webinar, what we're concerned with is vegetation responses to fuel treatments in the sagebrush cheap grass network. And in particular, we're focusing on the first three years post-treatment responses. Now, the fuels treatments we're working with First at the whole plot level, which means treated at the level of, depending on the site, 75 to 200 acre blocks. We have the controls, of course, and unmanipulated sagebrush stands. We have burn, which is a fall prescribed fire with a goal of 100% black, as most of you are aware, of course, that is not necessarily easily achieved. Um, we have a mow treatment where the mower height is set at 8 to 12 inches. And the goal of this was to mechanically reduce sagebrush cover about 50%, open up the canopy. Um, sorry, the tebuthyron treatment or spike uh, was applied at 1.5 pounds per acre by fixed wing 
And the goal here was to chemically reduce sagebrush cover again by about 50%. And then at the subplot level, the scale of 0.25 acres or quarter acres, on half of our permanent uh, subplots that we're monitoring, we applied a Mazepec or in the form of Plateau. And as you're probably aware, this is a pre-emergent herbicide. Just a view of some of the sites we worked at. In Heart Mountain in Oregon, we have two sites that differ in their soils uh, and in their vegetation, but they're fairly close together. Moses Cooley, Washington is the farthest north, uh, has the highest density of Forbes, and Saddle Mountain in Washington is the lowest elevation of the sites. Again, we have these sites spread out, these seven sites spread out across six MLRAs. Uh, so it's a pretty wide geographic area. Now this Arnicky site in Utah is on a calcareous substrate. All the other six are on a basalt substrate. Um, but even among those, there's still a lot of differences in soil depth, texture, and fertility. And of course, we've got a strong climatic variation across this region as well. Uh, grazing is excluded from all of the plots, but they differ greatly in their actual grazing history leading up to the implementation of treatments. Just a few examples, the Oahe site in northern Nevada has, is within an, an allotment that has year-round cattle grazing. The Roberts site in Idaho is in an allotment with winter and spring sheep grazing. And the Heart Mountain sites are in a, in a uh, pronghorn refuge that does not have livestock and has not in quite a while. Across this network, we have some species that are very widespread that we consistently find. And I'll explain a few things. The relative frequency of the site is simply the percent of the subplots that we monitor that have the species present. So it's not a measure of abundance. And then indicator values, the smaller the value, the lower the value, uh, means it's a it is more representative across sites and subplots. Okay, so it's very widespread and therefore is not a good indicator of that particular site. Now, since we're focusing on Wyoming big sagebrush, it is kind of comforting to see that it is very frequent. It's found in every plot at every site, every subplot, sorry, at every site. We have some other species that show very broad distributions as well. Uh, squirrel tail is very frequent in all but the but two of our plots in Washington. Okay, and Sandberg's bluegrass, for example, is is very frequent in all but two plots where it's moderately frequent. Okay, so we have this common thread of species running through the network. We also have some species that are much more localized and found, or at least are frequent, only in particular areas. Needle and thread grass is only in uh, Moses Cooley in Washington and the Roberts site in Idaho, for example. Uh, Atherbex convertifolia or shad scale is only found in the Onaki site in Utah. Okay, so we have a lot of things that are in common, but we have unique vegetation characteristics as well. If we think of some of the patterns of variation across the sites, uh, not surprisingly, mean precipitation and elevation are correlated, as they are in most parts of the world. Sandberg's bluegrass is negatively correlated with both of those. Cheatgrass is negatively correlated with sagebrush and soil carbon, interestingly. Uh, and then in, in analysis, we don't really have time to go into those, suggest that there is strong biological and environmental overlap between the sites. There are unique differences, but there's a lot of commonality through this network. And the two Washington sites are one somewhat distinct from some of the others. So the big question then is, did these fuel treatments result in this, which is basically a cheatgrass jungle? or more something like this, a certainly healthier recovering stand with very little in the way of weeds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's look at how the treatments affected the cover of Wyoming big sagebrush first. Uh, first thing to notice is the green and the red, the burn and the mow treatments had significantly less cover after the treatments. 
than other treatments in all post-treatment years. Just back up a little. Zero is pre-treatment data, so this is before there was any treatment implicated in any of the sites. And then we have one year post-treatment, two year post-treatment, and three year post-treatment of all of these sites. Uh, so you end up with very similar cover with burn and with mow, but they do it different ways. The mowing is killing a lot fewer sagebrush. It's just reducing the canopy volume of the individual sagebrush. The tebuthiron uh, spike, the reduction was subtle and at least so far has not achieved the 50% tar tar target, but it is coming down if you look at the entire network data. But this is driven very strongly by, if we look at a site-by-site -site comparison, um, a strong response in the Washington sites as far as reduced sagebrush cover. Um, the other sites, there are more subtle uh, drops in sagebrush cover or no drop at all. Okay. So there's some site differences there. If we look at the mowing treatment um, by site, overall there was about a 60% reduction. We were shooting for 50%, but you can see there's a lot of variation from site to site. Uh, the Oahe in site in, in the Saddle Mountain site had the greatest reduction to about the same level. Very, very large reduction in sagebrush cover. Interesting, the Oahe, the sagebrush cover is 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 growing back very rapidly over this post-treatment period. We're seeing pretty strong increases. Um, if we look at the effect of the burn, except for Owyhee and Roberts, mortality was very substantial. So we did get very large reductions in cover as we were shooting for in the majority of the sites. Okay. Now Owyhee, the fire was very patchy, had very well burned areas and completely unburned areas, uh, which is why we did not get really strong uh, reductions. And Roberts was uniformly very lightly burned to almost non-existent burn. Basically, the fuel bed was so sparse and patchy that it just could not carry a fire well. So let's look at some of these in a moment. Um, but the idea here is that even under those conditions, though, you can get, you know, under those fuel conditions, you can get environmental conditions where it can burn. Strong winds in the summer anything can burn. And as we'll see, that did happen to Roberts in 2010, and we learned some interesting lessons out of that that we'll get to later in this in this webinar. So let's look at some of these. Uh, this shows what it, I'm talking about. This is the Roberts Idaho site. This is burn plot three years post-treatment. There's virtually, well, there's no evidence really of a fire having gone through here. It was really not a very successful. Oahe, on the other hand, we got some good burns going, but again, it was very patchy. There were areas that were extremely well burned. This is a burn patch three years post-treatment. And then areas within the plot that were basically completely untouched by the fire. And notice the very dense sagebrush at this site and a lot of dead uh, snags, sagebrush snags through here that, that are apparently due to aerobic moth outbreaks. Okay, so let's go on to some of the other vegetation responses to this treat, these treatments. Uh, if we look at the annuals, whether cheatgrass or the annual forbs combined as a group, um, the cover was significantly lower in the amazabic treatments than in no amazabic subplots in all post-treatment years. So that's these dashed lines you see in both of these figures. So throughout this three years post-treatment, Amazepic was greatly reducing the, the cover of these annuals. Um, we do see very strong increases in the cover of the annuals, especially in the cheatgrass, in the most uh, disturbed sites, in the burn okay, and in the mowed sites. But if we put down Amazepic at the same time, we can basically stop that large increase in the annuals in response to these treatments and keep them at very low levels over a number of years. 
you know, if we look at individual treatments across sites, uh, the mowing treatment first, we see large increases in cheatgrass and mow plots following the, the treatment, but really primarily only at two sites, at Great Butte and Oahe, we get very strong responses. And Great Butte also had a large increase in the tebuthyron plots, which we're not going to actually take time to show, and in the burn plot that we see here. So most of the sites have not, over three years post-treatment, had large increases in the cover of the annual grasses. But Great Butte has had large increases in basically all treatments. There's some warning, though, however. This is just three years following treatment, and longer-term results might give us something different. For example, the Anaki site in Utah is now five years post-treatment, and the exotic annual grasses and forbs are cover is starting to increase more rapidly than it had been. Okay, but at least there's a pretty long window there without large increases in the cheatgrass in most of the sites. Moving on to the tall perennial grasses, so this is basically most of the grasses except for for uh, sandbirds bluegrass. Okay, at year three, the control treatment, the unmanipulated treatment, was marginally significantly lower than other treatments. So we are getting an increase in percent cover of perennial grasses in response to treatment, which is what we want to see. Now, this is driven mostly by strong increases in the burn and the mow and little increase in the spike plots, which makes sense because the spike treatment is only opening up the canopy minimally and slowly at this point. But in the future, it might be a different response. Now, interestingly, this cover increase is due to growth of the plants, not to an increase in density. We see very little change in densities. And in some of the sites, we're actually getting decreased density while the cover is increasing. So we're not getting a recruitment response yet, but we're getting a growth response of the existing tall grasses. Switching to the short perennial grasses, which again is primarily the Sandbirds bluegrass, the cover appears to be reduced in the Mazepic treatments in that first year. That's these dashed lines again. It goes down in all of our plot level treatments if we have a Mazepix. So it seems to be damaging the cover of the Sandbergs bluegrass, but note that the recovery is fairly rapid after that, uh, so it's not a permanent damage. If we look in the burn plots uh, across sites, generally the cover in the burn plots did not change or it actually decreased in some of them. Uh, the cover of these short grasses. But at Moses Cooley, there is a very large increase in cover following the treatment. Stands out as a very unique response in our network. But again, this increased cover was due to growth uh, because in Moses Cooley, the density was actually decreasing across that period. Perennial forbs. Uh, there's not a whole lot of response we can talk about here. There is this apparent increase in year three post-treatment, and this appears to be primarily due to a strong positive response at one of the Heart Mountain, Oregon sites. So basically, one out of our sites, is, out of our seven sites, is primarily driving this increase. And importantly, there's no apparent emazopic impact. Now let's look at some of the things we can find from some unplanned manipulation, some uh, some surprising, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that, some surprises that mess up your experimental design, but can actually give you some pretty interesting insight. The Jefferson fire in July of 2010 in our Idaho site, where more than 100,000 acres burned mostly in about an eight-hour period. Uh, this is up by the, in, the IMEL. And Interstate 15, which we see on the eastern edge of this burn, has been repeatedly closed because of blowing dust. It's one of the major issues we have with large burned areas. And this fire burned much of our plots 
which are in these northeastern portion. You see that Roberts site there. So this, you know, remember this is a site that we could not get to burn with the get to burn with the prescribed fire, but this wildfire blew through without any problem. If you remember back to those burn plots uh, that photos we showed earlier of Roberts and remember that it was it looked untouched. This is what it looked like after the burn. So under the conditions in which this fire went, everything burned. Um, now let's back up. That fire was in 2010. If we look back at 2009, this is a plot that was not treated with the Mazepic pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, in 2009, and it was a great tumble mustard year, as you can see in this picture. Very, very abundant. In the same year, this was a treat plot that had been treated with the Mazepec two years earlier. Okay, still that same great tumble mustard year, but as you can see, there are virtually no annuals anywhere in that plot. Now, interestingly, several of these plots that have been treated with the Mazepic did not burn in that Jefferson fire because there were no fuels there basically to burn. So even in that intense fire that was burning over 100,000 acres, these plots were not burning. And those that did not burn now have little cheatgrass where those plots that did burn are filled with cheatgrass, interestingly. And we're going to actually see some of this shortly if we look when we look at a, a photo sequence. But first I want to talk, change gears a little bit and talk about this idea of interperennial plant gaps. Okay, so what are we talking about with interperennial plant gaps? It's basically if you put down a transect, put down a tape measure, the distance between the bases of perennial plants at the soil surface. So example here in the upper left, we have an example of a small gap, about 28 centimeters, between the bases of these two perennial grasses of exposed soil. And then on the upper right, we've got this example of a very large gap. There's a lot of annuals in here, but it's a very long distance from the base of a perennial plant to the next base of a perennial plant. So why should we be concerned about these plant gaps, interperennial plant gaps. This is basically the portion of the soil that is at the greatest risk for erosion, other forms of disturbance, and invasion by exotic annuals such as the cheatgrass you here, see here. So these are vulnerable parts of the landscape. And these treatments can change the gap sizes that we find in a site. One example here is that both at Rock Creek and at Onakee, the burn treatment actually increased the mean interplant gap size. So we're actually making larger gaps with that burn treatment. And I suspect this is primarily from removing the sagebrush. So what this means is that you are increasing the threat of erosion and of annual exotic vegetation with that treatment. You're making bigger gaps that are more vulnerable to our threats. If we look across sites, 160 centimeter average gap size, okay, which is what we see with this red line, uh, roughly corresponds with 30% perennial grass cover. And this also seems to represent a kind of a threshold above which um, you're basically getting the point where you have the potential for cheatgrass dominance or at least co-dominance of the system. It's a condition we don't really want. We want it to be lower than that in mean gap sizes. Um, in order to, to protect them from erosion and invasion. If you look across our network, some sites have very small gap sizes, like Moses Cooley all the way over here on the right. Um, Saddle Mountain is not bad either. But some of the sites are starting to get to very large ones, and Gray Butte in particular is characterized by very large interperennial gaps. Okay. They're well above the mean and the median. Mean and the median are well above this threshold 160 centimeter gap size. 
meaning that this gray butte site should be extremely vulnerable again to our threats of erosion and of invasion by annuals and especially cheatgrass. And if you think back, that's one thing we have actually seen. Gray Butte is the site that had those large increases in cheatgrass cover following any of the treatments, probably because it was predisposed because of these large spacings between the perennial plants. So to summarize this portion, uh, fire can kill shrubs and to some extent grasses and increase basal gap sizes. Uh, we have some evidence that plateau can temporarily decrease perennial plant cover and potentially increase basal gaps at least by a little bit. Interperennial plant gaps are strongly related to cheatgrass dominance. Okay, we have strong evidence of that. Now the implications of this is management might consider maintaining the smallest gaps possible, focus not just on cover, but a distribution of plants that reduces the distances between the perennial plants we have in the system basically reduces the size of those vulnerable areas and therefore reduces their vulnerability. And that monitoring gaps between perennials is fairly easy to do by putting out a, a tape measure along the ground and it may provide a fast early warning indicator of invasion potential of a site before it's treated. More work needs to be done on that for sure. Uh, now Roberts, let's look at that photo sequence that we talk, I talked about. Now 2007 is pretreatment. Okay, so these are burn plots. As we go through this sequence on the left, we're going to have subplots that were not treated with plateau. On the right, we're going to have plots that were treated with plateau. But again, this first figure is pretreatment, so nothing is on the ground, and you can't tell a huge difference between them. And then, just to reiterate once more, these are burn plots, but you can't really tell it because the burn was so unsuccessful. But what you can see, if you start looking closely here, is that in 2008, one year after the treatment here on the left with no plateau, there is cheatgrass scattered all through this picture. It's not really big and dense, but it is all through the system. You really don't see that on the right with the plateau. 2009, the same thing. There are annuals scattered through this sagebrush system. You don't really see those on the right. 2010, the same. And then, wham, the next day, the fire came through. It was lucky sampling. You look at 2011, after the, a year after that Jefferson fire, and look at the difference we were talking about. Where there had not been plateau and where it burned in the Jefferson fire is now extremely thick with, with cheatgrass. Where that plateau had been put down three years prior to the burn, four years prior to this sampling in this photo, it did not burn because there was not enough fuel there, and right now there's not any cheatgrass in there either. So the conclusions overall of what we, we are talking about up to this point is that the treatments that we've applied are resulting in increased perennial grass cover after two plus years. Um, this is one thing we wanted to do, increase the vigor and the cover of those perennial grasses. But we have to keep in mind that recruitment is very slow, and that shouldn't be surprising in these, in these semi-arid systems. It's probably very episodic that we get new individuals established. Uh, interestingly, though, the sagebrush is regrowing and recruiting uh, fairly steadily at most of the sites. So the sagebrush is coming back. Uh, it's our, our perennial grasses that are slower coming back in numbers. Okay, but again, they're doing fine in cover. Cheatgrass and annual forb cover do increase following treatment um, if we're not putting down a mazepic at the same time. But if we do use a mazepic, uh, control of these annuals is achieved for two or three or even more years. Uh, we've been pleasantly surprised at how long-term the effects uh, have been. Uh, Imazepec 
does impact native perennial grasses during the first, first year post-treatment. Really, it's, it's just affecting those uh, shorter grasses, the, the boa. Okay. Um, but there seems to be fairly good recovery after that first year reduction. And then, keeping this fairly brief, we want to make sure we acknowledge uh, the critical people that we couldn't have done this study without and can't continue to do this ongoing study. Uh, Joint Fire Science Program, the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Nature Conservancy, U.S. Geological Survey, National Interagency Fire Center, a lot of people have been very, very involved in helping us get with site location and with applying the treatments and with allowing us to conduct these studies on their sites over the long term. And for any more information on what we've talked about today, and hopefully we are going to have a discussion now, I've, I've left plenty of time for, for questions, um, but any more information on, on what we've talked about today or these project in general, uh, please go to the Sage Step site, uh, sagestep.org, and the Great Basin Science Delivery Project website, of course, also has lots of good information, including this webinar will be archived there uh, in a very short time. So I'm very happy to open up for any questions at this point. All right. Thank you so much, Gene. I'll now field questions for Jean, so please type your questions or unmute requests into the question box and I will do my best to pronounce your name correctly. And while I'm waiting for the first questions to come through, um, thank you so much Jean for giving our website a plug and I just want to let everyone know that we've been in the process of converting our website so I have not done a very good job of keeping our site updated since the holidays, so um, I'm very sorry about that. and. Um, but this webinar will definitely be posted uh, either later on today or tomorrow, and um, and it will also be immediately available on the GoToWebinar site, um, and the webinar system will send you a link. Okay, the first question has come through from Dustin Cabots. I'm working on a post-wildfire treatment on cheatgrass. What slopes should or shouldn't I consider? What slopes? Mm -hmm. um, we certainly have some evidence, thanks we a lot of the work done with uh, Dave Pike's group out of Oregon, that uh, the more difficult problems you're going to have are, not surprisingly, with those south-facing slopes. The more stressful conditions are going to be, are going to be much more of a challenge, uh, both getting the perennials established and dealing with the sage, with the uh, cheatgrass. Um, but I don't have a general good rule of thumb for the use. All I can say is the cheatgrass is a huge challenge in these systems, no matter where you are. Um, the Wyoming big sagebrush systems are, are it's, it's a challenge. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Stephen Beekadem, and he asks, how was a Mazapic applied and at what rate? Um, the rate was at, I believe it was six ounces per acre. It was on the slide of treatments that I went through fairly quickly, but again, this entire webinar is going to be available to look at uh, at your leisure. I'm pretty sure it's six ounces per acre, and it was applied with a boom sprayer on uh, ATV because we were doing this at the level of our quarter acre subplots. Um, uh, so it was a it was a practical approach more than necessarily what would work at a large scale approach. Okay, thanks. John Copeland asks, were oh, were application rates of a Mazapic uniform or did they vary by site? We went with uniform. Uh, as anyone who's read about a Mazapic or, or actually used it knows, its effectiveness can be extremely dependent on uh, litter cover, live vegetation cover, um, soil characteristics. Uh, but basically, we went with a single uniform dose 
to use across the network. We tried to do this as much as possible with all of our treatments. Um, but we picked a dose based on literature that suggested it would be fairly effective uh, under most conditions. And the results certainly hold that up uh, across the network, even though we had differences in, in a lot of the things that can influence the effectiveness of a Mazepid. We got good control with it and control that lasted for years. OK, thank you. Nathaniel West asks, after drill seeding sagebrush, how long should you wait before treating with plateau? <laughs> I don't really have the answer to that. Um, we do know that the perennial grass seedlings differ from species to species in how, how vulnerable they are to a mazepit. Um, there's been some studies done with actually seeding and amazepicking at the same time. Uh, we, we think, the evidence certainly supports the idea that amazepic is more harmful to annuals than it is to perennials, even in those early eye stages. It is considered an annual specific uh, herbicide, but it's, of course, you know, a poison is a poison. It's going to affect even adult plants to some extent. But some studies have been done by putting down a mazepic, ask your seeding with a variety of different perennial species, and we know that some species, as seedlings, are extremely vulnerable to a mazepic, whereas other species are much less uh, harmed by a mazepic. So it partly depends on what you're seeding. Okay? Is it going to be a vulnerable species or not? It also is going to depend a lot on the environmental conditions. You know, to some extent, a lot of that long-term treatment effect of the mazepic we're seeing is not so much the continued, it, this is my belief, is not so much the continued action of a mazepic in the soil three years later, okay? but more so by greatly depleting the, the annual seed bank in that first year, it's slower to recover. Okay? So my suspicion is that, is that depending on the species you're planting, and I don't have a list of of all the vulnerabilities, depending on the species you're planting, I think you could probably apply a mazepic um, the next year or at least two years after uh, without a lot of harm. But nobody has really looked at that in detail yet, I have to tell you. OK, thanks so much. And sorry for the pounding upstairs above me. Um, OK, the next question is from Rosemary Pendleton. Jean, for those of us, maybe just me, that are not as familiar with the chemical treatments, is Plateau, the Amazepic, et cetera? Uh, sorry, I did probably go back and forth. Plateau is a brand name of Amazepic, which is basically the generic chemical name. So Amazepic comes in comes under a lot of trade names, but the most widespread, best known, uh, and I think the people that invented it, BASF, uh, is sold under the name of Plateau. Okay. And then the same for the, the uh, Kedifiuron is the chemical, more of a generic name for the herbicide, and the best known example of it that's very widely used is Spike which is a trade name. And that is, is just as the amazepic is, is especially harmful to annuals, um, the spike is basically especially harmful to woody plants. So it's used for shrub thinning or shrub elimination if you put down enough of it uh, without having huge effects on, on uh, the herbaceous component. At least it's thought not to have huge effects on herbaceous. Thank you. OK, the next question, I'm going to try to say your name right. Tanil Leonard asks, have you done any treatments that combine amazepic and seeding? 
If so, what type of results were you seeing with perennial, perennial establishment? In this network, we have not. But in another study I'm involved with at a Golden Spike National Historic Site, uh, where we have a difficult environment, a difficult situation, uh, with a fairly healthy sagebrush overstory, but virtually no perennials in the understory at all. Uh, it's really depleted, and it's an annual understory. And to make it more resilient to fire, we're trying to help them get perennial grasses back into the understory, um, an understory that's dominated by cheap grass. So we tried some trials where we both seeded uh, without a Mazepic and seeded with a Mazepic. And um, we definitely got fairly good emergence of our perennial grasses with the Mazepic. But unfortunately, given the challenges of this site, um, in a year that went from cool and wet to very hot and dry overnight, at the peak of a grasshopper outbreak, nothing actually survived through the first growing season. So we can't really say anything more than we had emergence of perennials, uh, even in the face of the Mazepin. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make it in the face of a Mazepin. More work needs to be done on that for sure. I think I think that this Mazepec is is showing great promises as a tool, but it's a tool we need to use very carefully. I will tell you there is some evidence already that some of these annual weeds in some populations, some sites, are evolving resistance to a Mazepec. Uh, so it's a tool that that can be helpful, but we can't just start dumping it out everywhere every year, or it's not going to be a useful tool in the, more, in the future. But I think it's a good tool, and we need to work more on understanding the limitations and how to best use it at the same time as we're getting perennials established. OK, thanks so much. The next question is from Bob Gillespie. Is there a relation between annual grass invasion and soil temperature regime? Um, well, <clears throat> I would I would say perhaps it's not something I've thought about a lot, but we certainly do know that if you go along elevational gradients, uh, if you go from from the lower, drier, hotter Wyoming big sagebrush up into the uh, higher, cooler mountain big sagebrush zones, you have progressively less and less of a problem with cheatgrass domination of sites. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question or not. You know, when I came to Utah about 20 years ago, everybody was telling me that cheatgrass was never going to be a problem in less than 14-inch precip zones. Uh, it just couldn't do it in those really dry areas. And that's one of the major weeds at the Nevada test site, which is way less than 14-inch precip zone. So it's, it's definitely a very major threat in these lower, hotter uh, environments. And definitely, if you get up into the higher elevation, cooler elevations, uh, it's less of a problem. Thank you. Um, just before I ask the next question, Jean, I don't know if you're bumping your mouse, but it's kind of like moving all over the page. I just thought I should let you know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the next question is from Ryan Shane. Was there any seeding trials associated with this research project? No. No, this, this particular network was designed basically to see, one thing I didn't mention, some of the variability we have in this is all of our plots were selected so that they actually have a range of conditions. In the woodland network, uh, it's a range in tree canopy cover, okay, from what 
what Robin and others call phase one to phase two to phase three conditions. And then in the cheatgrass sagebrush network, we ensured we had a range in perennial grass cover. So what we wanted to see was if these treatments are applied, how does the existing system respond to these treatments? And are there particular positions on these gradients of tree cover or perennial grass cover where we can reliably predict that it will improve in condition versus predict that if we don't seed, it will deteriorate in condition. So we intentionally did not put any seed down onto the, any of these treatments. We just wanted to see the response of these plots depending on the condition of the micro plot or the, the subplot level uh, monitoring. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Linda Kerr asks, was there any correlation between native perennial species composition and appearance and or persistence of cheatgrass following treatment? Uh, we haven't looked into that level yet. It's actually something that's on the, on the plate. Um, there are ideas out there about uh, a diverse stand is going to be better able to keep weeds out than a less diverse stand because we might be using uh, more of the available resources by having a variety of rooting strategies, rooting depths, uh, resource uses, and things like that. We can basically take away more of the available resources. Um, there are also some interesting ideas about and whether a diverse vegetation reduces the diversity of weeds that are able to get in there, or if we simply have with diverse vegetation environmental conditions that are favorable for a lot of species, and where we find diverse native, we also find a high diversity of the exotic invasives. Okay, so we're going to start teasing that stuff out. But at this point, we have not looked at any of these diversity issues and the link between diversity and weeds. Thank you. The next question is from Dustin Cavitz. Were these sites grazed following treatment? No. Uh, and this is an issue that we've gone round and round about and had lots of discussions with our agency partners. Um, all of these sites have a pre-grazing history, but all of them are protected from grazing after treatment. They're e from livestock grazing. They're either in an area where there's not going to be any livestock, or we spend a lot of money to fence them in. And this does cause some issues with the results, because most of the lands that we're treating in the West are not going to have the luxury of not being grazed for five years, 10 years, 20 years. They are going to be grazed again. But it was impossible, given the diversity of allotments that these, you know, that these plots, these sites are spread across, it was going to be impossible to have a controlled grazing treatment that would be meaningful at all and it would basically be interfering with our ability to see the response to other treatments. Okay, granted, the response to fire or the response to mowing might be different if the site is grazed and not grazed, but if one of our sites is going to be uh, winter spring grazed by sheep, another one year-round grazed by cattle, another one only winter by cattle, and on and on and on, it was just going to cause too much variability for us to really get any value out of that. So there are limitations to the approach we took. Ungrazed is not necessarily natural, but at least we don't have this confounding factor of all these different possible combinations of grazing type, season, and intensity uh, 
uh, that would have really made a mess of trying to, to interpret results. If we had plenty of money, we could do a parallel study. <laughs> you have a checkbook? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, Lene Rogers um, asks a question that is similar to a question I see further down from Ryan Shane, so I'll try to ask them in the same question. Lene Rogers asks, since six ounces per acre were applied and you didn't do trial seeding plots, would you consider seeding following a Mazepic herbicide treatment, and what results would you expect? And Ryan asks, is it best to spray a Mazepic before or after drill seeding? Based on what I've been reading and as my thoughts have been developing on this and seeing what we've seen out there so far, okay, I'm a scientist. I need to really test things to make bold statements. It's just in my nature. But my strong feeling at this point is put a Mazepic out. It will have a huge effect on the weed seeds you have available the following year, seed the following year when the seed bank of the weeds is greatly reduced. Um, I want to continue doing more trials with simultaneous versus delayed uh, and see what really works. But my gut feeling at this point is probably the best way to use them as a pick is to reduce the seed bank as much as you can and then the following year put in the seeds that you want and as we always do when we seed hope it's a good weather year <laughs> all right thank you lynn danley asks will density of desired species perennial grass continue to be followed we continue to be followed to see if recruitment is occurring, particularly in the Mazepic plots. Absolutely. Our plan, it is becoming more and more challenging, as I'm sure all of you know, the funding environment is not looking very good. Um, we are, this initial, this initial study was a five-year study. We spread it out money out over six years because of the delay in getting the money and getting started. Um, we're beyond that already and are on to long-term monitoring money. Our plan is to follow these plots for 20 years. We will not take every piece of data that we've been collecting on every single plot every single year, but we will take some data at every subplot or at, at every plot every year and more detailed measurements about every three years. But yes, the plan is absolutely as long as we can string together the funding sources, uh, we're going to monitor all of these responses because that's the only way we're going to really understand what these treatments do on the land. You know, in these environments, you're not going to get the final answer two years, three years, or even five years after the treatment. These are long-term processes, and we're going to do our best to capture those across the entire network. Great, thanks. The next question is from Ken Visser. Can you expand on the concept of gap management? I understand that gap sizes can be monitored, but what techniques would be suggested for <laughs> reducing gap size if monitoring reveals they are increasing? That is a good question. You know, a lot of a lot of our you know, I understand this whole concept of, of you can't do everything with the resources we have available, with personnel, with time, with money. Uh, it turns out most of what we focus on is repairing the really hammer days, okay? After wildfire, wildfire rehabilitation takes up a huge amount of our restoration monies, in a sense, um, because they're emergencies. Um, but I think we need to start focusing more, and I know several people that are working on this. In our, our group, we're doing a little work, and, and Dave Pike out of USGS in Oregon, his group is doing a little work. We need to start developing ways to actually augment the understory of things that are not in terrible shape so that we can make them more resistant and resilient. <laughs> And so some of that is going to be working on how do we fill in these gaps. 
without dragging a drill across what is basically a a mostly healthy uh, sagebrush rangeland. Um, right now, I don't have the answer to that. Um, certainly, at this point, the best use of that information is to go out and see: Do we have a potential problem here or not? Fairly easy measurements, um, but we need to start addressing them. Okay, we do have a problem. How do I deal with it? And I don't have the answer yet. Thank you. Lene Rogers asks, in response to Tanil's question, were you seeding cool or warm season grasses? Uh, that was seeding with a Mazepec. I'm trying to remember back. Uh, our work out at, at, um, at Golden Spike was, was uh, it was mostly cool season grasses. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jean Chambers asks, there likely is a fairly strong relationship between annual grass invasion and hydrothermal regimes. At higher elevations, upper PJ zone, cheatgrass growth and reproduction is limited, although seed germination can occur. That sounds more like a comment than correcting me than a question. <laughs> it does. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> okay. Brad Jessup asks, why include woody species in the gap analysis when it's the perennial herbaceous component that contributes most to resiliency? Uh, the woody vegetation does still contribute to breaking up those gaps. Obviously, if we're thinking about resiliency in response to a fire, okay, those perennial grasses are going to be more resilient than the shrubs. And we saw some of that data in how the burn increase the gap sizes, okay? But as far as looking at a site, and is this vulnerable now to invasion? Is this vulnerable now to erosion, okay? Those woody plants breaking up those larger gaps are still very important, okay? I think what you're thinking about, and this is important, okay, if you're thinking about the resiliency of the system to a burn, for example, to a wildfire, okay, you might indeed even want to keep track of the gaps between perennial grasses as well as the overall gap distribution. They're going to tell you different things. The gap between the perennial grasses might be a better measure. I haven't thought about this before, but might be a better measure of what we're going to have if this site burns as opposed to what we have now, which is important now. Great, thanks. Okay, we have three more questions. Jennifer Walker asks, do you have recommendations for when to reapply a Mazepic to previously treated areas? I personally would not want to go down the route of continuing to apply it in the same site. My hope that a Mazepic becomes a tool for helping get helping to get a site established. Okay. But if you just keep putting it on every three years, every four years to keep those weeds down, um, annual weeds can evolve very rapidly with an annual life cycle and a strong selection pressure which a Mazepec is, it's killing a very large proportion of the population. So a, a rapid life cycle combined with a strong selection pressure can evolve resistance very rapidly uh, within years. And so my advice would not to keep be to keep reapplying to a site, but to use it as a tool to help get it in better condition or help get a, a really bad site established to begin with, and then work with other means uh, rather than to continue to apply them as a pick. My personal opinion. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Ryan Felkins asks, was the amount of precipitation at each site recorded? Uh, yes. We have weather stations at the sites. Um, that data is not presented here, of course. But we, we are monitoring um, precipitation, uh, soil temperature, soil moisture at 
various depths, um, and and the, the moisture is actually associated with different microsites as well, uh, tall grasses, open air spaces, things like that. So we are keeping track of all that data. Great, thanks. The last question is from okay. I'm going to try to say, say your name right, Pat Nilica, and um, the comment and question it is, thanks for a great presentation. You mentioned that soil carbon is negatively correlated with cheatgrass. Is that because higher amounts of carbon ties up soil nitrogen, making nitrogen less available to annuals like cheatgrass? It can come from that direction, but there are several studies that actually suggest that with a, a lot of cheatgrass in the system, it actually increases the depletion of soil carbon. Okay, I'm not going to say at this point we have all the answers because there's not been a lot of work on that. But at least two studies have suggested strongly that cheatgrass occupation actually increases the loss of carbon from the soil. Okay, but a lot of things can be involved. As you mentioned, yeah, higher carbon could be mobilized nitrogen, which we expect to disproportionately harm annuals. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that was the last question. Uh, I want to let everyone know that um, the recording of this webinar will uh, be immediately sent to you tomorrow via the GoToWebinar system, or I meant to say automatically sent to you via the GoToWebinar system. And then I will also post this on our website, and that should be up um, within this week. Um, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to email me at any time. I can forward your questions to Jean, and we'll try to get those answered. Sounds um, good. Great. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jean, for your presentation, and thanks, everyone, for joining. My pleasure. And, yes, thanks for joining. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great day.